we've been working through, if you've been regularly with us, we've been working through this series called Uncomfortable, where we've been looking at some of the aspects of what it means to live as Christ wants us to live. And the fact that some of those things to our natural self become very uncomfortable. We've spoken about uncomfortable grace and we've spoken about uncomfortable growth and no one likes to really grow outside of our comfort too much and we've talked about uncomfortable groups. Uh, this morning Troy is going to be joining in on this series. He's Today is a bonus sermon, okay, because it was not included in the original series. So you get a bonus today. And uh, so it's really exciting to hear, and I'll let him introduce that as he shares that in a minute. But um, I just want to pray with you and encourage you to follow along as Troy shares. And Troy, would you come on up, mate, and I'll share with, pray with you before you get started. And, and uh, it's just a blessing to have some of you will have met Troy and Jen last time they were here, but um, let me pray. Father, I thank you for this man and his family. I thank you for his faithfulness, his, his understanding, his giftedness. And this morning as he shares again with us, may we recognize the power of God and experience the power of your Holy Spirit upon us. May his words be your words, his thoughts, your thoughts. And may, Father, we experience your presence as we listen and respond here this morning. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Yapoon Wesleyan Church. Woo! So good to be here again. And you have definitely brought on the good weather for us this weekend and uh, made it very enticing to come up and be here in Yapoon more often. I sent texts back to my eldest daughter to say you really do need to consider moving up here and being part of the church family and, and took photos down at the beach yesterday, down at the, uh, the, the boardwalk down there and um, she wrote back and said, yes, it looks very nice. So we're almost convincing her to come. And that would be great if she comes here. She's, she's a piano player and she'll join in and help if that ever happens. So wouldn't that be fantastic? And it'll give me a good chance to come and visit more. <laughs> So it's been so good to come and do some leadership development with you and uh, most of you will remember from last year, about a year ago, came up and had that opportunity to spend with you and uh, it's been just over a year since then and so just a thrill for me to be here again, one of my favourite churches and uh, so thank you for having me. Now um, before we do get stuck into the, the, the message today, um, I want something really unique, you, I'll, you've probably never been asked to do this in church before, okay? But I woke up this morning and I thought, how can I open my sermon this morning? And I thought, get everyone to look at their feet. Everyone just have a really good look at your feet. Lift your feet up, have a good look. I want you to describe your feet. Give me one word that would describe your feet. Sore, someone said. <laughs> All right, a couple other words, quickly. Useful. useful. Your feet are useful. Very good. That's a couple others. Long. Long. Big. Small. Yep, different shapes and sizes. Smelly. Smelly. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to say that one. Excellent. Comfortable. Comfortable. Very good. Okay, so this pattern, what was that one? Whoa, good one. Okay, so there's all different ways of describing our feet. Um, I looked at my feet this morning and I went, Troy, you have beautiful feet. <laughs> have you ever described your feet as beautiful? I want you to look at the person's feet next to you right now. And I want you to look at them in the eyes and tell them you have beautiful feet. You have beautiful feet. Beautiful feet. Now, we'll come back to that a little later on and you'll understand. And now what I want to, to say is that I want to think about what did Jesus not say to the disciples when he first chose his disciples to some things he didn't say to them. He came up to, to them. He didn't say, come and follow me and I will teach you to be greatly influenced, spiritual influences. I will give you the most deep insights that you could imagine. He didn't say that. He didn't say, oh, come follow me and we'll learn praise and worship songs together and we'll have some wonderful times of singing 
worship. No, he didn't say, come follow me and we'll gather in home groups for sweet fellowship and potluck lunches. He didn't say that either, did he? And he didn't say, come follow me and we'll have some really powerful prayer meetings. I mean, they'd be pretty powerful with Jesus there, wouldn't they? But he didn't say that. He didn't say, come follow me and I will make you members of the church and we will grow this body. He didn't say that. Now, not that all these things aren't important, because they are important, we know that, but do we all agree that Jesus was fairly insightful? Do you think? He was. And I think his words, maybe the first words he spoke to those disciples on that day were very purposeful, they were very strategic words. So I want to have a look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. These ones will not be on the screen, this is a bonus that I thought of this morning. Or last night when I was looking through this. Now, he said, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. He said, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. What did he say, church? He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, most of us here are followers of Jesus. Can I hear an amen? amen? Well, Jesus wants to make us fishers of men and women and children. When he, it all comes down to it, Jesus wants to save the world. Jesus wants us to reach out to the world for him. We are his A plan. His spirit is at work all around the world and he wants to use us. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He wants to use us. In Luke 19, 10, when Jesus saved Zacchaeus, he went to his home and he said, for the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus was very purposeful, very strategic. He knew his mission. He knew what he was on about and he lived it and he announced it, and he proclaimed it, and he sacrificed his life for it to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus told the story of the one lost sheep and how the heart of the shepherd is to leave the 99 that were found to go and find the one that was lost and bring it safely back into the fold. That's the heart of God for a spiritually lost world, isn't it? Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. That's the good news. Or is that great news? The word gospel means what, church? Good news. Good news needs to be proclaimed. Good news needs to be spoken. Good news needs to be told. It needs to be shared. And I know throughout my Christian life over the last 27 years or so, Throughout my Christian life, I've heard lots of people say things like, I don't preach the gospel, I live it. I don't proclaim the gospel, I just live it out in front of people. People see the gospel in me. I don't speak it. I don't use words, people see Jesus in me. And I think that's because maybe it's uncomfortable to preach the gospel. Maybe it's uncomfortable to use words and it stretches us out of our comfort zone to preach it out. Maybe it's because we've never really learned the ingredients of the gospel and we don't not fluent in how to communicate that gospel and how to share it. Maybe there's some fear factor in doing that and so it becomes uncomfortable. And I agree that the gospel needs to be lived out. The fruit of the spirits of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, goodness. These things need to be seen in and through us. The world needs to see Christ in us. They need to see and feel the presence of Jesus Christ in and through our lives. But that is not the power to salvation. To see Jesus in you is not going to save them. Hearing the gospel preached and proclaimed is what will save them. And so that is the good news. So I agree we need to live it out, but the gospel message needs to be proclaimed, and guess who will be the ones who proclaim it? Us. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 8 to 10, the word is near you. It is in your mouth. Say, in your mouth. And it's in your heart. 
And that is the message that concerning faith that we proclaim. Church, say, proclaim. If you declare it with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe it in your heart that God raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you will profess your faith, and you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is good news, church. The good news is the message that needs to be preached. It needs to be spoken. It needs to be heard. It needs to be received. And then they will be saved. It goes on in Romans 10, verse 14 to 17. And this should be on the screen. Clicker. Good. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how could anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, read it with me, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all of the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. Can you read that last sentence with me, verse 17? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Yapoon Wesleyan Church, we have a look at our feet this morning, and we all know now that we have beautiful feet, because the Bible says we do. You are a people who will bring good news to Yapoon. That's uncomfortable. Can I hear an Amen. But that is what Jesus is calling you to do, to bring good news to your poon. Jesus is calling you to be fishers of men. As a pastor, I've often thought about Jesus and these most strategic words, like those first words that he spoke to the disciples when he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What about some of the final words he spoke to the disciples before he left earth and when to be in heaven, we know the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, he says, Go therefore, let's bring that up. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Great, strategic, purposeful words that Jesus left with us. He didn't mix his words, did he? He was very specific in those most important moments. He wanted his final words that we would remember to be his mission and calling on our life. Go. Go into the world. And then we read it in Mark. Um, yeah, Mark 16. But is that up there? It is. <laughs> I'm not used to this yet. Mark 16, verse 15 and 18. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then in Luke chapter 24, verse 45 to 49, it says, Why is this one not working? I don't know. Can you help me? I'll tell you when to click. All right, this, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that re repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed, say proclaimed, in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, not just the pastor, not just the leaders, but each and every one of us that follow Christ are witnesses. We are witnesses. John 20, verse 21 to 23. Jesus, next verse. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And we preach these words, telling people in our churches, you know, get out there and reach people with the gospel. Go and preach to all nations. Expand the kingdom of God. Let's evangelize the world. 
Remember those words in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the disciples were commended by Jesus. It says that they shall receive power when the Spirit of God comes on them. Receive the power and boldness and courage to be his witnesses, to be his witnesses, ultimately witnessing the message of Jesus to the farthest reaches on the planet. The early church would have a global impact. That early church, the whole world, would be touched because of their faithfulness to this message. This is a very different date that we live in today than what the early church was in. You know, with all of our services and programs and the way we do church in the Western world today, I think that uh, it's a very different delivery system to what they had in the early church. All they had in the early church, they didn't have our technology, they didn't have our systems of communication, they didn't have the internet. All they had in the early days was the Great Commission. All they had was a passion and a zeal and a full heart, full of the passion, courage, boldness of the Holy Spirit that had given them the courage to witness. And the church grew by millions and millions and millions and millions of people because of this calling on their life, their passion for this great message and this is a great commission it grew very organically and every day it says in acts 2 47 it says that the lord added daily to their number those who were being saved you know something i've discovered having been in ministry for over 25 years now and sharing this gospel message so often is that most christians really have very little idea about the actual ingredients that make up the gospel and how we should go about preaching that gospel and maybe that's why we don't hear it so often. Why is it? I don't think it's because we're unable to preach it. Jesus would not have told us to do something that he didn't think we could do. He enables us to preach it. I think it's because we are not equipped to preach it. We are not trained to preach it. It's not modelled so often to preach it. It is something that we've not practised very often how to preach it. And we've never been given that chance to practise it, or rarely. We've probably read the Gospels, we've, we've probably heard the Gospel many times, but have you practised preaching the Gospel? And we've heard sermons about the Great Commission so often but are we equipped to get out and do the work of evangelism we've been told to do it and it is the core of our message even paul said in romans 1 16 will be on the screen he said for i am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of god that brings salvation to everyone who believes first the jew and then to the gentile and just looking at that again, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it, it is the power. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel has some, the Holy Spirit has some ministry when the gospel is preached to transform lives. What is the gospel? What are the ingredients of the gospel? What is the good news that we preach? It was my birthday last week and I had some cake. Who likes cake? I'm getting you all ready for morning tea, okay? What's your favourite type of cake? Fruit cake. Chocolate cake. Pavlova. Pavlova. That's good because they're gluten free. I can have those ones. Bee stings. Cheesecake, carrot cake. Who likes carrot cake? That was Karen, yes. A few people. Excellent. Now, if you have the cake, we have to have all the right ingredients, don't we? And if we don't have all the right ingredients, the ca- have you ever tried a piece of cake and thought, oh, there's something missing? <laughs> they didn't put everything in. There wasn't the right amount or the right ingredients in that cake. Like, what would happen if you tried to make a cake and there was no egg in the cake? What would happen to the cake? fall apart what would happen if we missed out the sugar in the cake it wouldn't taste good would it 
What happened if we wouldn't put if we didn't put flour in the cake? I could have a big gluten-free cake, right? I could have that one. <laughs> so we have to have all the right ingredients so that we get the full cake. True? And it's the same with the gospel. We have to have all the right ingredients, all the right amount of ingredients, or we don't have the full gospel. And I think it's so important that we communicate to the world the full gospel. The full gospel. Especially for non-Christians. Many of them don't really know anything much about Jesus. They might know the name Jesus, they might know we worship Jesus in church, but they don't really understand who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And I think it could even be a fatal mistake to presume that non-Christians actually know a lot about Christianity. They normally don't know a lot about Christianity, and this is why the full gospel must be communicated. The full gospel takes nothing for granted. It doesn't presume that non-Christians know anything about Jesus. But to proclaim that full gospel, you first need to know the recipe. You need to have all the ingredients. You need to not only know it, but practice it and be able to preach it. Right? So in a nutshell, the gospel will explain who Jesus is. It'll explain why Jesus had to die. And it will explain what now. Who, why, and what. Who, why, and what? Who is the gospel? Why the gospel? And what now? Why am I separated from God? Because God is holy and I'm a sinner. Why can't God just let me into heaven? Because God is righteous and I'm unrighteous. There's a, there's a gap there. Why must I be judged? Because we have broken God's laws and God is a God of justice. Someone must pay for that sin. Why did God send Jesus? Because I needed a saviour, because the world needed a saviour. Why must I make him the Lord? Because he's worthy to be the leader of my life as my creator, the lover of my soul. He wants to be in a loving relationship with me. See, we don't just need to know what the gospel is, we need to know why the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just some random Christian message, it's very specific ingredients to this. It's not like some Christian phrases that we might say to the world, come to church and find God and he'll make your life right like he has for me. Life will get better with Jesus in it. Or we'll say a Christian phrase like, God is awesome, you should try him. That's not the gospel. Or God loves you. God loves you so much and you need to know him. That's not the gospel. And we say these Christian phrases like that and they're good, but that's not the gospel. That's not the power to salvation. You see, the gospel isn't just random Christian messages. It's a list of ingredients. They are just Christian phrases that I was saying, but they are not the gospel. Even our testimony is not the gospel. You may include the gospel in the way you present your testimony, but it is not the gospel. The gospel is a very specific message. And it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It's a profound and life-transforming message. And when all the ingredients are right, it saves people. When Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, he was talking about specific message intended to be spoken out, to be spoken out to all who would believe. This message has specific ingredients, and we're going to go through them right now. Anyone interested? Three people. Awesome. (laughs) In other words, the content of the gospel must be memorized as Christians. We must know this. In the book of Acts, the disciples, the apostles, went from city to city preaching the gospel. There are a number of accounts where they preach the gospel. Each presentation, slightly different for their specific audience, but always having similar, the same ingredients. They were tailoring this message for the people who are listening, but it contained the same ingredients. They were giving the full gospel. 
Scholars who've studied this have found this very specific things that came through. And they summarize these in different ways. But there's a very common thread that comes through and there's five key ingredients that we're going to look at right now. And I want you to say them with me. They'll be up on the screen. The gospel ingredients are, number one, sin. Say sin. Righteousness. Judgment. Jesus is Savior. Jesus as Lord. We need to click, 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 click. Let me try it. Are you ready? Sin. Now we've got two people clicking. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Say it with me again. Sin, righteousness, judgment, Jesus as Savior, Jesus as Lord. These are the five ingredients of the gospel. Now I'm going to preach the gospel for you right now. I want you to see how to preach the gospel. I'm going to give you a little bit more in-depth version because I've had time to prepare for today. But if you were preaching to a friend in the street, if you were sharing the gospel with someone you've been praying for and reaching out to, you take these five ingredients in your mind, sin, righteousness, judgment, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is Lord, and you present each of those ingredients and you will give the full gospel. So here it is. Are you ready? Are you ready? God created me to be in a relationship with him. But I have a problem. Say amen. <laughs> I have sinned. I've sinned. And my sin has separated me from God because God is holy. And holy simply means perfect. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standards. Just like everyone else here in this room, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen, God of his, fallen short of his standards, which means that we all have a problem. And the Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's sin. Let's move into righteousness. Since I've sinned and because God is righteous, remember he's holy, he's perfect. That means that there's nothing that I can do because I'm unholy and I'm unrighteous. I've sinned. There's nothing that I can do to restore my relationship with God. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. I have actually earned spiritual death, which is why there's a judgment. I've earned spiritual death. It's the only through what Jesus has done that I could have my spiritual life with God restored. I can't do enough good things. I can't climb that ladder of good works to get back to heaven. I can't do anything in my own strength. I need God's righteousness, his perfect blood that was shed on a cross to wash away my sins, to cover over my unrighteousness, to remove it from me. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Without Jesus, I have a massive problem. But with Jesus, I have his righteousness. With Jesus, I have eternal life. Let's talk about judgment. The Bible says that one day there's going to come a judgment. In other words, I'm going to be accountable for my actions. I'll be accountable for my sins. I have to face God and I will be found guilty for all the things that I've done against God. Now, that's a really big problem because that kind of punishment, that judgment, would mean that I would be separated from God for all eternity. Separated from the love of God for all eternity. And that would be hell, wouldn't it? My problem is that I need a saviour. And you need a saviour to receive that gift of eternal life through God's grace. Not that it's deserved, because I don't deserve it. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? So Jesus took my place. 
If there was a courtroom and I was being judged for my sins, Jesus stood in my place and took my punishment and set me free. So it's still a judgment, but my judgment was placed on Jesus. He took my sins, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's talk about Jesus as Savior. Thankfully, God's got a solution to my problem. And that's that he gave his son, Jesus, to be my savior. Through his sacrificial death on a cross, he paid for my punishment of my sins. Jesus forgave me for my sin. He forgave you for your sin. Jesus redeemed us from our unrighteousness by shedding his perfect holy blood on that cross, and then rising from the dead to overcome the power of death and sin. He stands in our place on that judgment day, and he has been trialed for my sin. He took my place, and he's taken all my guilt, and he's taken all my shame, and I'm no longer in condemnation because of what he did. He took all my sins upon his shoulders when he died on that cross. He is my saviour. Jesus is our saviour. God sees us as his perfect children now when we see him as our saviour because his righteous blood has washed away our guilt. All we need is to confess him as our saviour and he will save us. We need to simply believe by faith in Jesus Christ, it says, and we are saved from sin And we receive the gift of eternal life. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Nothing else you can do. Confess and believe. It's a free gift. It's not deserved. It's just a gift because God loved us so much that he gave his only son for whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's God's will that none would perish. When we believe in Christ, we have been justified, which means just as if I'd never sinned. I've been justified. He sees me as perfect. I've gone from being a sinner to being a saint. In the eyes of God, because of who Jesus is in my life, I am now a saint in Christ. He is my saviour. That's why it says in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that amazing? Sin, righteousness, judgment, Jesus as saviour. Jesus as Lord. Jesus as Lord. Let there be one more essential ingredient to this gospel, which is so often left out, and yet so important. Jesus is not only our saviour, rescuing us from our sin, redeeming us from our past, but he has rescued us and redeemed our future. We need to make Jesus the Lord of our life. We need him as a Lord of our lives, which means he is our leader. He is the one in control of our lives not in a dominant, controlling way, but because I have freely given him control of my life. I have offered him, surrendered to him the rest of my life, that I would obey his will, obey his word, obey his ways. This is about repenting from sin, turning around, walking the other way, instead of walking away from God and into sin, walking towards God and living for him as the Lord. The Bible says in Romans 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Say, stand. Which we now stand. We stand in this grace. We are now living in this grace. We live each day, each moment of each day in this grace. He is my leader, not just my saviour. He didn't just save me to get me into heaven and prepare me for the other side of eternity. 
He saved me to prepare me for this side of eternity as well, that I could live each day and moment in his presence with him as my Lord. I don't just believe in God for salvation. I follow him as my Lord. I stand with him every moment. In other words, it's not just confessing my sins to receive and believe for forgiveness. Salvation is a free gift. But to make him Lord is not free. To make him Lord will cost you everything. To make him Lord is to cost you the rest of your life. Just like Jesus paid the price and gave everything for you. It cost him his life. And to make him Lord is to give him your life. He loved me enough to sacrifice for me and I received him as my saviour. And the question for us today is, do you love him enough to surrender your life and sacrifice your life to make him your Lord? Church, that's the gospel. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to all who will believe. That's the message that I heard when I was 17 years old in the Salvation Army Church and I got up out of my seat and I walked to the front of that church and I still remember it so clearly. When that gospel was preached, when those five ingredients were shared, it's a simple message, but 29 years ago, it changed my life. It had all of the ingredients that were essential. Sin, I'm a sinner, separate from God. Righteousness, I need God's righteousness to cover my sin. Judgment, there is a judgment coming and I need someone to stand in my place. And that is Jesus. Jesus is Saviour, I need to believe in him. I need to receive him. I need to confess him. Jesus as Lord, I need to repent surrender to him and make him the leader of my life sin righteousness judgment jesus is savior jesus is lord it deals with our problem it deals with god's solution and it deals with what now and that's a message our world needs that's the message Yapoon needs to hear that's the message we can all preach If you miss out on number one and just do number two, it doesn't make sense. If you miss out on what is the gospel and just go to why the gospel, it doesn't make sense. Why would people want to hear about Jesus if they didn't know they had a problem? <laughs> you need a saviour. Well, they don't know why they need a saviour. They don't understand so that's why we have to have all of the ingredients, just like the cake has to have all the ingredients. They need to understand why they have a problem. If you miss out on number two, and you've just told them all about their sin, but you don't tell them God's solution, we have another problem. If you miss out on number three, the what now, you've given them the, the what and the answers the solutions but you haven't given them what to do with it all three are important and you may leave them just asking great jesus has died for my sins awesome everything's okay now <laughs> i didn't need to do anything they might think can you see why it's important to communicate the problem the solution and the what now yeah as christians the gospel is the most powerful message it's always been and always will be the central core message of our church. God uses this message to powerfully affect and transform human hearts. The gospel message is far more than just giving out information because it's empowered by God's Spirit. The gospel message is ordained by God to save people. He works through the gospel message. Billy Graham wrote these words. 
I have found that there is a supernatural power in this message that cannot be rationally explained. The gospel has its own communicative power. When we preach Christ crucified, there is power, dynamite in it. This is the gospel I have declared on every continent and before every conceivable group. Billy Graham. Establishing relationships with unchurched people is powerful as are meeting the needs of unchurched people, helping them and providing for them, as are answering their questions. They may have questions about Christianity. They're all important things. As are praying for them and fasting for them. All of these are important things, yet none of these activities are given that same status, that same power status as the New Testament says, the preaching of the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Paul didn't say establish friendships with them and and pray for them and, and meet their needs and answering their questions will be the power of God for their salvation. Paul didn't say doing these good things for them is going to save them. Uniquely, unashamedly, the gospel is singled out in the New Testament as a supreme instrument for the salvation of lost souls. So, Yapoon, Wesleyan Church, take this uncomfortable gospel, practice it, practice it on someone, and then go out with your beautiful feet and take this gospel to everyone who needs to hear it. Let's pray about that. Can we stand up together and let's pray. I want you to pray maybe just symbolically. Let's look down at our feet. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want you to ask God, am I being that conduit of grace and love? Am I being that conduit of the message of the gospel? And I want you to ask God right now that he will fill you with his Holy Spirit to give you boldness and courage to be his witness. That you could witness the message, declare it, preach it, not just live it as we should but declare it obeying jesus when he said go and preach the gospel to all nations god let these feet let these feet obey you lord take me anywhere that you need me to go with your message help me declare it with courage and boldness help me lead people to know you in personal way lord Help us to be the light shining your word all around. Lord, let this community, let Yipun be transformed by this gospel message. Lord, let this church be a beacon on a hill. Let it, Lord, change and transform people's lives through this gospel. We thank you, Lord, for using us in this way. Help us to be your hands and feet. Let us communicate a full gospel. Help us, Lord, to know how to preach sin, righteousness, judgment, Jesus as Saviour and Jesus as Lord. Lord, let us give that full gospel. Lord, help us to communicate it with love and grace, not with judgment. Lord, you are the one who transforms our hearts, it's not us. Lord, we never want to pressure and force or anything. Your Holy Spirit is gone before by your provenient grace. You are at work in the hearts of men and women and children. You are already preparing them. And as you use us as chains, as links in the chain of grace, in each person that we connect with, Lord, when we come to that fork in the road where we can decide 
Is this conversation going down that road or down that road? Lord, let us make a decision to be bold and courageous for you and to present your gospel. I pray a new anointing on this church. I pray a gospel anointing, a sharing of that gospel on this church. I pray this church will be known for it. That's a church that preaches the gospel. And while we're all in prayer, I couldn't let this opportunity go by without asking, is there anyone who would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and as their Saviour today, as their Saviour because you need to be forgiven and as the Lord because you want to surrender your life to him? And if that's you today, as everyone's just in prayer and I'm certainly not going to embarrass you, but I'd love to help you make that step of faith. I'd like to pray for you to invite Jesus to be your saviour, to be your Lord. So everyone's just got their heads bowed in prayer and maybe you could look up at me if you'd like me to pray for you, that you would invite Jesus into your heart, forgive you for your sins. If that's you today, maybe quickly just lift your hand up a little bit so I could see you, I don't want to miss you. Just quickly look up at me and lift your hand so I could see you. Anyone? Thank you. God bless you. Praise, praise God. Thank you. I'll pray for you too. Anyone else here would like me to pray for them? Three people. Wonderful. God bless you. Anybody else? Lovely. Thank you. God bless you. Wonderful. Another person there. Okay. Anybody else before I pray? God's Spirit is here, church. His Holy Spirit is here. And He is touching and transforming your life right now. For some, it's that moment of salvation, inviting Jesus in. For some, it's being empowered afresh by the Spirit to be a witness for Christ out in this world. But right now we're going to pray a prayer of salvation and I want everyone to repeat after me, joining in with those few that raise their hand. We're all together as one church here. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and I ask you to forgive me for my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and making a way to be forgiven. Right now, I turn around from my sin and I repent of my sin and I turn towards you, Jesus, as my Savior. You died in my place and have given me a new life. Thank you for forgiving me. Now help me to make you the Lord of my life. Be my leader. I invite you in now. Holy Spirit, fill me. And give me a new life. Help me be a witness for you. Of your love and of your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you know what? The Bible says that when new names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that all the angels and all of heaven has a massive party and celebrates. And that's what they're doing right now. And that is the gospel message, church. It's the power of salvation. And some even here today have experienced that. It is a decision of faith that you've received a gift of God's grace.